Welcome to Morningstar Christian Chapel YouTube channel. Please remember to hit that subscribe button, like button, and the notification bell so you can find out when we go live or post a new video. And be sure to leave a comment about what God has shown you in this message. Thanks, and enjoy the study. All right, let's open our Bibles tonight as we continue our study through 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 6. If you've been with us, I'm sure you are well aware now of the, of the setting of this letter that Paul wrote, one of at least three letters that Paul wrote to this church, a church that he planted, spent a year and a half there, showed up here at the worst time in his life. You know, he was as discouraged as someone could be. If you read the first part of this letter, you will find that Paul showed up ready to quit. He didn't preach to anyone. He just went to the synagogue. He, you know, he had he had some terrible troubles since he landed in Europe. He's been uh, beat up and arrested and chased out of more than one place. Now finds himself several hundred miles away from his friends who told him to get out of Dodge before they hurt him. And he, he shows up in Mars Hill in Athens. And that didn't go well. And then he arrives in this very decrepit and, and very uh, immoral city, but one of the most immoral cities, uh, Corinth. Now, he, he was discouraged. It would be so discouraging that the Lord would actually appear to Paul and encourage him that there's, there was a city he would be protected in, that God had lots of uh, uh, fruit in this town, a lot of people he wanted to reach, and Paul would spend uh, the next year and a half doing just that, protected in every way. He, he finally had his friends show up, and, and he, his spirit was revived. The fellowship was helpful to him. And uh, the church was planted. But that was seven, eight years ago. Paul is now in Ephesus planning a church. And uh, he'll be there for three years. And, and then news comes of this church's struggles. And it's not been easy. It's in a very, like I said, carnal place. And the church has not grown very much. They definitely had the fruit of God's spirit in their lives. And Paul remembered it very well. He was sure this was a work of God. But there was a lot of sliding away from what God had intended them to be. And so this letter, the next letter in your Bible, the Second Corinthian letter, as well as the one that he refers to in a couple of places that he, we don't have, that was a, a letter of questions written by some elders and some folks in the church. Um, Paul tries to address literally everything that's going on. But, but at the root of it was carnal believers who really weren't walking with God. And, and, and things had gotten worse rather than better. And things needed to change. And so uh, this is Paul's, you know, love letter as a father to a, a church that he cared for. Um, it is, uh, it is in your face kind of stuff, but it's like a dad would talk to his kids. You know, he he wants them to do well. Beginning back in chapter eleven, and and it'll continue through the end of chapter fourteen. Paul writes to them about their life as a body in the church when they meet together, as we are here when the church met together. He commended them early on for their diligence and wanting to do things uh, as far as the Lord was concerned regarding women in leadership. But then he spoke to them about how their, their potlucks, if you will, that were designed to help the poor who didn't have much, as well as their approach to communion, which wasn't at all discerning the Lord's body. He said, I commend you on the one, but not on the other. And so he, he spoke to them, and, and invariably these gifts of the Spirit came up, which were being used not to serve, but to get honor for yourself. And Paul wrote in chapter 12 that the Lord works in various ways. He called them diversities of gifts. He called them differences of ministries. He called them diversities of activity. But he said in, in all the ways that the Lord works, it's always for his glory and for the good of others, that the gifts were given to profit the body as a whole, not to, to say, look what I can do, and then you know try to get some honor out of it. The Lord was behind it all. And it is of great value to the church, but the Lord should get the honor, not us. And it should be used so that he would be honored. He gave us a partial list there in chapter uh, 12. There's also a list in Romans, I think, 12, Ephesians chapter 4. And, and you know, the message from Father of the Church was, look, there are many gifts that you are given as, as, as work-related, if you will, skills that God gives you that are in your possession. And then there are gifts that God gives you spiritual gifts, vocal gifts, power gifts that really come from the Lord at, at a time when he is willing to impart them to you. And, and you need them, whether it's a word of knowledge or whether it's prayer for healing or faith, 
You know, the, you, you don't carry those around saying, I can use these when I want. Rather, you walk around looking to the Lord, hoping he'll use you. And so Paul spent a lot of time talking about that down through the end of verse uh, 31 of chapter 12. In fact, he said to them, you should really want the best gifts, but those are really situational driven in the sense that, you know, depending on where God has put you, these are the things you need to depend upon him for. Now he'll pick up in chapter 14, this use of the gifts in the public assembly, and it'll be the longest portion that we have on, on order in church meetings and how the gifts of the Spirit should operate among us. But in the middle of this, he stops to say, you know, in the middle of this, you have to consider why you do what you do. And he turns to talk about the fact that these saints were using the gifts of God to honor themselves, almost as if it was a competition, rating them, if you will. And Paul interrupts his own teaching to say, look, the motivation has to be the love of God in your heart to be useful, to serve others. That's, you're a vessel that God wants to use. And the, though the Corinthians had not come behind, Paul said, in any gift the Lord had given them, there was very little love to drive them. So, you know, the purposes of God were not being accomplished. I, I mentioned to you last week, it is much easier to be doctrinally correct than to love. It is, it is much easier to be active than to be merciful. It is easier to be angry than it is to forgive. And Paul goes out of his way in this chapter, and it's a short one, but it's, it's powerful, to say we need God's love operating in our hearts. And we told you last time this word agape is really a New Testament word. It very rarely appears at all in historical Greek because it really is a definition that is a New Testament one. The love of God in the hearts of the people as displayed by God sending his son to die for sinners like us who don't want to hear from him, who always aren't walking with him, who are in absolute rebellion against him. And yet God moves in his love to save us. And then he says, once we're saved, he puts in our hearts his Holy Spirit, which brings to us that characteristic of love. So much so that in John 13, Jesus said, it is this love, this agape in your life, that will define you as a believer, will, will identify you as such. More so than these gifts or power or whatever it is, you know, your talents, it's the love of God shed abroad in your heart. We, we talked last week about the fact that by definition, this agape love is self-sacrificing. It seeks the, better, the better, betterment of others, not yourself. It is not emotional. It is first a choice. When the Lord said, love your enemies, you can't feel love for an enemy, but you can choose to act in love towards your enemies, praying for them, even those that despitefully use you. And when the Lord said that there in Matthew chapter five, he said, you know, if you just love those who love you, what different are you from the world? But this is the love that, that transcends those things and overcomes them. So throughout the, Old, the New Testament, the Holy Spirit calls on us to pursue love, to put on love, to, to walk in love, to practice this love of God, which is clearly defined in these verses. And if you read them fast enough, they won't hurt you. <laughs> but if you stop to think about them, they'll just lay you out. Because, uh, yeah, I don't like them. And, and, and I see myself, I'm thinking, oh, all these years I'm, I'm growing. <laughs> yeah, but not like I should. So last time we looked at just the first five verses here and saw that the, there was a supremacy, uh, supremacy, supremacy, that's right, isn't it? Supremacy, is that right? Yes, that is right. English major and all. Supremacy, not. Um, God's love over any gift that he would give you. In other words, those gifts can be used because of love, but you remove that love, that gift becomes useless to God's well, not that God can't use it. It'll become useless to your relationship with the Lord and to the, the long-term effects of it. Nothing can precede his love. It, it leaves you bankrupt and kind of worthless in the lives of the Lord. I have not love, it profits me nothing. There's no gain in, in it at all. So if, if his love in you as a born-again believer needs to be the uh, motivating factor behind your, your behavior and your, and your sacrifice and your service, Paul then lays out for us 
what that definition is. And like I said, we went through some of them last week. There, he uses 15 descriptions of agape in all. There, it's the most um, in, in, insightful, I guess, an in-depth definition. It's just in a few verses. Um, seven of them are positive. Eight of them are negative, what this love is not. So you learn by both contrast and comparison, if you will. Last week, we looked at one positive as we started, uh, and then we looked at seven negatives. Tonight, we will finish one negative and then the six positives. Last week, here's what we learned. That God's love in your heart suffers long and is still kind. That's terrible to read, isn't it? The love of God in your life suffers long. It is patient. It is responsive to pressure with kindness. We read that his love in our hearts doesn't envy. It's the word for covet or to be jealous. And it doesn't parade itself around to make others jealous. Not only does it want what somebody else has, it doesn't take what it has and says, I bet you wish you had this. And look at me, it is not puffed up. We read that God's love in your life and mine should not behave itself unseemly. The word unseemly is the typical Greek word for rude. It literally means, you know, that you push to have your own way, that, that, you're, that you're not willing to give in. It is a word that speaks a lot about being provoked into even outbursts of emotion. God's love in your heart, that's not the motivator. That's not how his love works. This love also thinks no evil. How are you doing so far? It thinks no evil. Now, I'm pretty happy when I say no evil. But thinking no evil, that's a whole different ballgame, isn't it? In fact, you don't even know that I'm thinking evil. But guess who does know? The Lord does. And he'd like to change that in my life. His love, when it's in control, doesn't think evil. This love does not think evil. It doesn't look for hidden motives. It isn't cynical. It's very hopeful. And so often the problem is over time we get very cynical. We don't trust anybody. We don't believe anything. We're sure that whoever's shaking your hands are out to take your fingers from you, you know? You're just forever looking over your shoulder. And unfortunately, the world can leave you that way, but his love will not. We read that his love bears no resentment. It holds no grudges. It keeps no record of wrongs. <sighs> Thank you so much. Look, the definitions in this chapter of his love in us are designed to bring us to a place where we want God to equip our hearts, to bring us to our knees and cry out for his help, to realize that we have a long way to go from having victory over the sinful nature that we've been delivered from, that we pray that God would put it upon us to be you know, those who walk in his love, because ultimately it is so distinguishable and so uh, far removed from the way the world operates that you can't help but hide it. People just notice. Last week we encouraged you to go through these first five verses and to read what love is, but, but take that word love and replace it with Jesus' name. And you won't hurt the text at all. You'll go, oh, that's exactly the way it should be. And then we said, and then try it with your own name. Good luck with that. Try it one time. Love, or, or Jack, suffers long. <laughs> and he's kind. Well, now and then. But that's not really what the Lord is looking for. So I find it painfully hard to read. It's easy to understand. The words are pretty much... Uh, self-explanatory, if you will. They're, they're not difficult to, underst to, to, to you know, get through to the knowledge of them. But at the same time, if you're really interested in pleasing the Lord's heart and being useful to him, boy, these things hit home. So we broke it up into two studies so that we wouldn't just all fall apart. And uh, I'll try to get through this so you can go home at 8 o'clock so you don't have to think about this any longer. <laughs> but at the same time, God help us to be more like the Savior that has loved us so. So let's start in verse 6, where Paul continues. It's the last of the negatives, if you will, by definition, so we can learn by that contrast. He says, love does not rejoice in iniquity. 
The love of God in the life of a, of a saint finds no joy in iniquity. The word means unjustness, unrighteousness, or if you will, just simply wrong behavior. You know, you've probably heard Christians remark about someone that they don't like or that they have little respect for. See, I told you, I never trusted them now. They've gotten what they deserve. And rather than breaking your heart, it rejoices your heart. Well, he had it coming, you know, got what was coming to him. But that's not God's love. That's man's sinfulness. And even if it was true, I think I would, I would challenge you to find one place in the Bible where the Lord rejoices in judgment. In fact, every judgment of God proceeds from a God with a broken heart, not from one that is rejoicing. Oh, that my people would listen to me. Oh, that Israel would walk in my ways. The psalmist writes in Psalm 81, and the Lord's lamenting. It's a weeping God. He's not rejoicing in iniquity. He just wants you to straighten out. Your love for the Lord and his love in your heart, you know, should be that you would leave the 99 who are doing well to track down and follow and deliver and carry back the one who has wandered off and now made his own life miserable for himself. That would be the heart of the Lord. Perhaps the most common form of rejoicing over iniquity is gossip. Gossip would actually do little harm if there weren't so many eager listeners. There's an audience for gossip, isn't there? And gossip, even, whether it, even when it's factual and completely accurate, still reveals the heart of a sinful person who loves to find enjoyment in the teller of someone who has failed. And that's a tragedy. Just for the sake of feeling better about themselves, lording over them in self-righteousness. It is a benefit to no one. You can see how hungry people are for this by the popularity of talk radio. It is constant. You listen to talk radio every day, I guarantee you, you're going to be the most cynical person in the world. You're not going to like anyone or anything, and you're pretty sure everything's a conspiracy. They're out to get you. Everyone and everything. There is no, there is no peace. There's no rest. There's just this hunger for the latest gossip. By contrast, God's love in our hearts wants the best for others like the Lord wants the best for you. He doesn't want you to sin. He doesn't want you to suffer the consequences of sin. I don't think one time would the Lord say to you or I, I guess I just want you to find out the hard way. No, he does what? He says, don't be like a mule. <laughs> just look at my eyes and let me do like this. And you come over there and we're all good and nobody gets hurt. It's the bit in your mouth that you won't like. And I don't like it either. And he uses the horse and a bridle for us to understand. God is much more interested in us doing well. You know, I want them to find God's best for their lives. I want them to be blessed because if you'll do things right and, and, and godly and obedient, you're in, you're in line for God's best. But what does, what does love not do? It doesn't rejoice in the iniquity of others. It doesn't find joy or satisfaction in the failures of others. I, I think it's for that very purpose that church discipline at least from a biblical perspective, is an act of love carried out by the body for somebody who has had a sinful life that won't repent and that really does need to own up to them. So, you know, the Bible has these directions like for, or even chapter 5 of this book where, where Paul said to them, don't, don't keep company with anyone who calls himself a brother but lives these kind of sinful lifestyles. Treat him, you know, as someone who's not listening. He's, he's still a brother, but you have to put some pressure on. The, the Lord will say there in, in Matthew chapter 15, that, that laying out that whole issue of church discipline, that it can come to the point where someone is asked to leave a fellowship so that they might so hunger for it that whatever sin they're hanging on to is less important than what they're losing. And God uses that because he doesn't rejoice in iniquity. He, he, he wants you to do well. Some people say, and we hear it sometimes, you should tolerate everyone in love. 
But look, if the building's on fire, it's not love to say, hey, sit down, we're going to be fine, and don't mind the smoke. You know, that, that's, not a, a, that's not love. It's always speak the truth in love. But the truth has to be involved. You know, when Paul wrote his Thessalonian letter, he said in chapter uh, 2 of Second Thess uh, Thessalonians, May the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God, into the patience of Christ, and we commend you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly, not according to the traditions you've learned from us. So grow in love, but pursue the truth. Love will have both equally so. Love doesn't rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in repentance and doing what is that right. There's always something, uh, I, I think there's something evil about it, a malignant kind of joy that finds the sinful knives of others as pleasurable. I, I, was, I was reading a couple of weeks ago back in Genesis 30-something, um, two. It's two, it must be two. Um, where, where Jacob, you know, struggles all night with the angel of the Lord. And he wouldn't let him go, but in the end, you know, he was touched in the hollow of his thigh, and, and it says that the sinews or the muscles of his thigh shrank, and, and the one thing Jacob had left to do, run, he could no longer do. He was literally brought to nothing. And from that day forward, we read there in Genesis that Israel would not eat that part of the animal that was around the thigh because they didn't want to rejoice in or partake in the failures or the shortcomings of others. And so they stayed away from it. There's no joy here in finding someone who has to be brought to the end of themselves that way. So love does not do and, and rejoice in wickedness. It rejoices in the truth. So look at verse 6, the second part. The, the positives begin. Love rejoices in the truth. We read last week, love suffers long and is kind. Those go together. Here we read, and then we read, he's not uh, envious and he's not puffed up which were paired together as a contract. But here, love does not rejoice in iniquity. Instead, it rejoices in the truth. Not the, well, that's the truth variety, but really God's truth prevailing in the lives of people that, that, that are around us. So after eight negatives in a row, we, what, what God is not, Paul finishes with a flurry of six positives to tell us what his love is in us is, and it begins with, we're rejoicing in the truth. We find great joy when people rejoice and embrace and follow the truth. When people are obeying the Lord, when they're trusting in his ways, when he's at the top of their list, when they con consult him for counsel before going their way, when they value his word, when they love God and his ways, when the Lord is honored, we should be excited. It's so good to see you at church. It makes me happy. I wish to, try to, to get everyone to church during the week so they can grow. It's, it's, imp it's important to them. But here you are. You're the joy of our life. It is good that you're here. It is good. And we can easily rejoice in seeing those things. A lot of times, church, you see the other things. Not so easy to see, but the love of God always finds tremendous joyfulness in the truth of God being pursued and taught and followed. And uh, that's God's work in you. In, in verse 7, he kind of throws them all together real quick. He, like a, <laughs> he, he says, this love of God in you will bear all things, believe all things, and hope all things, and endure all things. I always get stuck with the words, all things. Had Paul written... Love can deal with most things, or some things, or many things. I could get off the hook. But it says all things. God's love in your life doesn't seek an easy life for itself. That would be self-love. It's a denial of self. And so it operates in the hardest of conditions. And it will bear all things. The word bear is the Greek word steko. Steko means to cover up or to support or to, um, to, to uh, protect. 
God's love in your life will protect those around you. And while suffering, it continues to reach out to support in correction. It does so with the least amount of hurt. It's interested in the, the life of another. Though it is not willing to protect in sin, it is anxious to find ways to forgive. I think, I, I forget who said it, and I, I should re I wish I had, as a young guy, would have started writing down all the quotes I write in my Bible and who they were, because I go, oh, that's good, I write it down, I forget who it is. But someone said of this verse, God's love puts a roof over sin, the sin of others. It protects those who the Lord loves. Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Peter wrote in chapter 4 of his first letter to the church at large, above all things, have a fervent love for one another because this agape love will cover a multitude of sins. We're not hiding sin. We're just seeking to bear all things. And it's so different. You know, an oyster, you know, gets a little particle in its shell and it hurts, but it can't get rid of it. So what does it do? It covers us with precious substances attract, uh, sub, uh, extracted from its own life. You get a pearl. <laughs> but it takes really that life of the oyster in many ways. He's borne our griefs. He's carried our sorrows. He was smitten of God, wounded, bruised. His chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we've been healed. Love bears all things. When Ham tried to, or actually came to his brothers and said, hey, dad's naked, <laughs> just laying around naked. Shem and Japheth responded at once, but they didn't respond like Ham. They backed into the room or into the tent. They had garments with them to cover their father's nakedness in their hands. And they, in love, bore his sin. Eventually, Noah would bless these two boys while silently passing over Ham, pronouncing a curse upon the Canaanite branch of his family. It didn't go well for him because love bears all things, but there was no love here. You can measure how your agape growth by how quickly you are willing to cover the failures of others rather than pointing them out. And oh, Did you hear what they did? Proverbs chapter 10 says, hate um, strives, no, hate stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. It bears all things. Hey, it wouldn't be good if you fell and somebody just go, I got you, man, I'm praying for you, just, we'll get up, let's go. Rather than, oh, I'm telling everyone, I'm putting it on the Facebook with your name. Not good. It's convicting, isn't it? This Aren't you glad we're going to get to chapter 14 pretty soon? <laughs> all things. It bears all things, and it believes all things. Now, this doesn't mean that God's love in you is gullible, or that somehow you just throw your hands blindly over your eyes, and well, whatever you say, because we are to be discerning. But the love of God in your life will make you hopeful and ready to reach for what you hope is the best rather than the worst. It is quick to give the benefit of the doubt. It prefers to be generous rather than sincerious. It, it prefers to be forgiving. If the question is one of motivation, opt for the favorable. If it's about forgiveness, 70 times seven. If it's about hopefulness, God is more than able to do what he has promised. I think we all have a tendency um, to presume the worst. It almost is a, a, it's a, it's a sinful, I think, quality. You know, if you look at Job's counselors, they absolutely came to the conclusion um, that he was just a sinful man. That's why, why, why these things have, uh, uh, you know, came upon him. Job finally said to them in chapter 21, I, I know your thoughts and the, the schemes by which you would wrong me. And they were absolutely wrong about Job. In fact, God said of Job, there's nobody like him. That wasn't the issue. But there's this tendency in our sinful lives to place blame and to 
to think the worst. When God's love in us should harbor a hope that sees God and it sees his mercy. I think, I think literally God's love is the opposite of cynicism. And it is easy to begin to be cynical in the world in which we live, which always expects the worst at every step. But God can do more than we can ask or think. Oh, he's more than able. And his love is hopeful. I don't know how many of you, no, I'm not even going to ask you. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever, ever read the, the, the book Oliver Twist. I remember in college having to read a lot of these novels. But there was a guy named uh, Mr. Brownlow who had taken Oliver's twist in his home, willing to believe the story that Oliver was telling that he had fallen among thieves, which is why he was in the condition he was. But there was another guy, his name was Mr. Grimwig. <laughs> Maybe should have known he wasn't gonna be helpful. He was very scornful, he was very skeptical, he was very hateful. And so they had an argument about Oliver and, and his character, and they set up a test, uh, sending him to the library with a sizable money in his pocket. And, and Mr. Grimwig said, the typical old English, I will eat my own head, which I think he meant, I'll eat my own hat. His favorite expression, by the way, it always shows up, real cynical guy. If you ever see Oliver again, if he ever comes back from the library with money in his pocket. What happened next takes up the entire, the rest of the classic book. So now you have something you can go read if you like. But I'll ru ruin it for you if you want. Mr. Brownlow was right. Love does believe all things. We just trust the Lord. Oh, I bet he's not gonna do it. Eh, maybe so, but God is able. I think we should be the most positive people in the world, don't you think? Because the love of God, we know where we're going. We know what he's promised us. Even in a non-election year, you should be the most hopeful people in the world. Not only does love believe all things, love hopes all things. If, if, in, in conjunction with the, free, uh, with the previous one, God's love in us has its eye on the bright future, and it's not easily discouraged because God has made promises that you can count on. He sees beyond the immediate. If God's grace is at work, it is always at work, and if God is on the throne, he is always on the throne. We can be very hopeful, can we not? We shouldn't be discouraged. We shouldn't give up hope. God would not give up on backsliding Israel, even though he said, you kind of divorced me, but I'm still around, so hanging out. Paul would not give up on backsliding Corinth. Parents very rarely give up for their wayward children. They will pray with real diligence, in love, and his love in us has an expectation of greatness. The psalmist wrote time and again, you can read in a couple of psalms, why are you so disquieted and cast down, O my soul? Hope in God, for I'll yet praise him for his countenance, for his help. And you read that in Psalm 42, 43, over and over again. Why am I so discouraged when all I have to do is hope in the Lord? Love his love hopes all things. The future belongs to the Lord, who is love and he's for you. And there should be tremendous amounts of, of anticipation and assurance, not hopelessness, as the world. The world's hopeless. I guarantee you, within a few weeks, everything's going to be wrong again. And God's still going to be right. Love hopes all things. It bears all things. It believes all things. Last portion it endures all things. The word endures is the Greek word hupomeno. Hupomeno is a military term that means to stay in your position even when under attack. You're not going to flee or run. You're going to stand against the overwhelming odds, against the opposition that comes your way. You know, we mentioned, I think, last week of, of Peter and Jesus talking about forgiveness and Peter thinking that he had it all figured out when he said, I'll forgive seven times. And the Lord said, well, that's a good multiplier. Now multiply times 70, for love still refuses to stop loving. The last words out of Stephen's mouth while he was being killed by the people he, he sought to reach was, Lord, don't lay this sin to their charge. By his love, I can bear the unbearable. I can keep no records of long, wrongs. And by this love in my life, 
everyone can see that Jesus dwells in me. His love will not let us off, will not let us go, will not let us down. It's stronger than love, uh, than death. Mo and, and many wa waters, it says, can't quench it. This is what God introduces into your life when you're saved. This is what he wants to work in you from the inside out. So when you get to verse 8, I think you agree, love should never fail. Well, no, if all of these things line up, I'd be cooking. I fail back here in verse 4. <laughs> Having read and looked at the definitions of love in, in just these verses, it would, it, it would seem that it should be no surprise that you read this. His love in you won't fail. How could it when the Lord is in view? Love will outlast everything. It will outlast the Corinthians. It will outlast their petty differences. It will outlast the gifts which he's given them. It will outlast the life that they've had. When all is said and done in eternity, in the brightness of God's presence, the love of God will still remain and everything else will have passed. Now, this is not a promise that love will always succeed. I want you to think about that. Jesus loved us with a perfect love and lots of people re denied him, re rejected him to this day. You might say, well, that love didn't work. No, his love will not fail. But if you reject it, you fail. It's not his love that fails. He's available. But his love sometimes is set aside. The accomplishments of God's love will never cease. In fact, the love will outlast these gifts that the, whole, uh, the Corinthians were arguing about, favoring some, despising others, trying to use them to, to sound more spiritual. Prophecies will fail. They will cease. Tongues will give way. The need for a word of knowledge will, will not always need to be there. Um, there are temporal gifts. They're meant for today while we wait for the Lord. But love will never cease, never fail, for it is God's nature in us and will bring us into eternity because of it. How are you doing in the love department? I know. I was judging each one of you, thinking to myself, no, I... <laughs> Not even. Verse 9. So we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then which is that which is in part will be done away. So when I was a child, I spoke as a child, understood as a child, thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away these childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we're going to see face to face. And now I know in part, but then... I shall know just as I also am known. And now abide faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. We now see in part, know in part, prophesy in part, when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part will be done away. Until the um, 20th century, Every Bible commentator on this verse, and there were thousands of books, saw this correctly as identifying the return of Jesus, when we will see him face to face. He who is perfect, he who will make all things known to us, even as we're known, that now we see in part, we see dimly, we're, we're not there yet. We, don't, we need all these insights from God's Spirit, but then... When he comes, the need for the gifts of the Spirit will completely go away because we'll know, even as we're known, we'll see him face to face. The issue is now we need them, then we won't need them. In the last 100 years, however, there has been a movement um, very critical of the work of the Holy Spirit today, of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, of the need for the spiritual gifts in the church. And to substantiate that opposition, they have interpreted this word perfect and said, it's the Bible. So when the Bible was written, when the word of God is completed, when the manuscript was handed in, by the time the first century or so was over, there was no more need for these gifts of the Spirit. Because we have the Bible, that which they said is perfect. Now, I don't know how you come up with that unless someone tells you that. Because just giving a plain reading, and you know, the way you understand the Bible, first and foremost, is, is go with what it says. 
Don't seek to spiritualize it. In verse 12, we are told that as believers, we're seeing dimly as in a mirror. And we have the Bible, but we're still seeing dimly as in a mirror. You know, all mirrors prior to the 13th century, I think, were, were always a, you know, a very dim uh, ability to reflect what we see. It wasn't until the 13th century, I think, they began to put silver backing upon them. But before that, it was just highly polished metal. And at best, you got a distorted reflection of yourself. That's the word that Paul's using here. If you look in the mirror, you really don't get to see everything because we're not there yet. So we need what God gives us until that day that he comes for us. In verse 11, we're told we're spiritual infants in many ways. We're learning of God, but one day, not when the Bible is complete, because <laughs> we're still sinners, we're walking by grace, but when Jesus returns, we shall see him face to face, and we'll have all the understanding we'll need, and like I said, we'll be able to what did Paul say in 2 Corinthians? With, with unveiled face, as beholding in a mirror the glory of God, we're being changed into that mirror. Uh, but, but then Paul, uh, I mean, John writes in 1 John, uh, 1 John chapter 3, it, you know, as children of God, we don't really, haven't been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he's revealed, not when the Bible's revealed, when he's revealed, we shall see him as he ends, and he will be like him. Peter wrote, um, We've seen his love in us, and yet we don't see him yet. We believe in him. We rejoice with him with uh, joy unspeakable and full of glory. The idea is um, we need these gifts of God's spirit and this love of God working amongst us because that's our witness. That's our insight. That's the work of God in the life of the church. We depend upon each other, every gift, every, every part of the body. But when Jesus comes, these will all be gone. The only thing that will be left is his love. We won't need faith. He's right there. We don't need hope. He's right there. We'll still have his love. So it is a questionable doctrine that says that the word of God, which taught us that the gifts of the Spirit, <laughs> in which the word of God, which printed them, it's printed in here, we need them, now says we don't need them. You know, it is a doctrine based not upon the word of God, but upon prejudice, and upon preconceived ideas, and I think not forming a very good exegesis of the scriptures. It doesn't support itself. But if you're one of those guys that believe, you know, that the gifts of the Spirit are dead, we don't need them for today, they're, they're abusive and they've been abused, and, and they're way out to the, to, and, and look, the argument could be made, there are a lot of abuse in the gifts of the Spirit. That doesn't negate them. It just makes comment onto their misuse. Um, the church, needs these gifts of the Spirit today. I'll say, I always tell this to people, if the apostles and the early saints were told to rely upon them, how much more do we need them? They were there with Jesus. They watched and they saw. They had a lot more to go on outwardly than we do, in fact. But they will not survive to the next age when Jesus comes in, for then we'll have the full revelation of God. So, be careful when someone tells you, well, you know, we have the Bible. We don't need the gifts of the Spirit anymore. Not so. We need all the help we can get. That's why the Spirit's come to live with us. And one day when we stand before the Lord, hey, we'll have arrived. And then his love will be the only thing that needs to continue. Everything else will have been fulfilled. So uh, when Jesus comes, those things will fail, but love will not. And that's, I think, Paul's point. But we, we need a lot of these things that you're counting on now, but not for our glory, just to keep us close. So he ends by saying, there is faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of them, the, the one that lasts the longest, the one that will continue. When you get to heaven, no need for faith, no need for hope, but you'll still need his love. So may God's love fill your heart. May we practice that. Not just talk about it, and next week, we will uh, tackle the use of the vocal gifts in the church assembly. I think there's a lot of misinterpretation. I hope that we can clear them up. The Bible is fairly clear on these things. It isn't very difficult, but people tend to make it. So even like those who want to write off what we just mentioned to you, there are a few verses up. Um, notice what Paul starts, though, in verse 1 of chapter 14. He uses the word, just pursue love. 
and then we can talk about the gifts in our midst. So next week we will talk about God's guide to an afterglow service. <laughs> I hope you won't miss it. Or read ahead and see what the Lord will say to you. Father, thank you tonight for gathering us together. I know that, Lord, we are interested not just in filling our minds with your word, but we want you to fill our hearts with your ways. And, and I know that it's easy to read over and then find someone who's not doing it as well and just excuse ourselves from the lack of growth or the lack of, of, of progress. But Lord, I know for the, for the nearly 50 some years I've been saved, I, I, I got a long way to go in your love. And I wanna grow in that each day. May you help me and may you help us to just be the, the, the kind of examples of, of God's spirit living in a heart that overcomes the flesh and all of those obstacles to get in the way. And just like the Corinthians who were so overwhelmed and overcome with their, their selfishness and their, 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 their self-isms that, that Paul had to really lecture them and, and, and challenge them to, to return to the ways that they should have been walking. May you help that, us to do that as well. You can be a, a, a tremendous witness for the Lord just by walking in his love. Take these verses, carry them with you. Read them often. Question yourself. See how you're doing. I think it's the only way we, we, we get ahead is we do that simply just by the desire. I don't know, I'm getting a accompaniment. <laughs> but I think that's the only way we grow. We, we, we grow by letting God teach us his ways, amen?